Um, I know the board says Hebrews 11, but could we read instead from Matthew 22? Matthew chapter 22 and from verse 15. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22 and verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these things, that these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked, th asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him any more. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to us. Let's turn again to uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 13. Hebrews 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. 
have you noticed how rare it is nowadays to see uh, atlases or road maps for sale in shops? Some garages still sell them, uh, but not so much these days, uh, given the uh, arrival of uh, the advent of satellite navigation systems. But it used to be that when you went on a journey, uh, you would consult the road map, you'd get a general idea of the route you had to take, and then you'd make your way until you were a few miles perhaps from your intended destination, and uh, then you'd pull over and just get your bearings before the final run into the destination. Well, the writer to the Hebrews is doing something like that here in these verses uh, tonight. He wants us to get our bearings. In chapter 12 and verse 1, he says to us uh, that let, we are to run the race with endurance, uh, run with endurance the race that is set before us. We want to go on enduring in the life of faith as Christians and as part of his encouragement and exhortation to endure In the life of faith, in chapter 11, he takes us back to the Old Testament uh, believers who show us how to keep going in the right direction. And in verses 13 to 16, he's telling us how to get our bearings as we go on enduring in the believing life. And we get our bearings by recognizing certain important things. The first is this, that we, we need to be aware of and we need to recognize our true identity. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, that is, not having received what was promised in the promises of God. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They confessed that they were strangers and and pilgrims on the earth. It's the same kind of idea that we find in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, where Peter describes God's people as aliens and pilgrims. A pilgrim or a sojourner is a someone is someone who has only temporary residence. They have a home somewhere else. Their homeland is somewhere else, and the place where they presently find themselves is not their home, it's not where they really belong. And these Old Testament believers had that concept of themselves. That was their identity, and that's how they thought about themselves, strangers and pilgrims. That's true of us also, because we have promises given to us in God's word that we have yet to embrace and uh, and to know in the the fullest extent we, we don't however regularly and naturally think about ourselves in that way if you were asked about yourself i doubt very much that the first thing you would say of yourself is that you're a pilgrim and a stranger on the earth you might say well i'm an engineer or i'm a nurse or a school teacher or whatever. You don't ordinarily say to people, I'm a stranger and I'm a pilgrim. That way of thinking isn't natural to us, though it ought to be if we are Christians. Uh, There was a bishop of Glasgow, Robert Layton, who wrote a commentary on the uh, epistle of Peter, the first epistle, and uh, a very helpful commentary. And he once spoke about death. He said if he had the choice of how and where to die, he would choose to die in an inn uh, as someone on journey. That's what he would do. And in the kindness of God, that's exactly what happened to him. When he was visiting in uh, London, 1684, he was staying in uh, the Bell Inn in Warwick Lane. And that's where he died. A stranger and a pilgrim in the earth. There are people in places where they don't really belong. I don't know if you remember a few years ago when they uh, started up that uh, large Hadron Collider in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, a 27 mile long tunnel under the Alps, a huge scientific uh, instrument and scientific experiment. And uh, there was a man there from Aberdeer 
Lynn Evans, Dr. Lynn Evans, and he was in charge of that whole project. And when they started up the Hadron Collider, of course, people were there from all over the world, international press were there to cover the story. And to everyone's surprise, when the top man was being interviewed, over the ether came the unmistakable lilt of an Aberdeer accent. And it seemed a little bit out of place. Even Dr. Evans said that he couldn't believe where he was and what he was doing. Well, that's the sort of thing we've got here. God's people confess that in one sense they don't belong in the place they find themselves. They're strangers and pilgrims. Well, where does that idea come from? Well, it comes from all that we read about Abraham in the book of Genesis, as we saw some months ago. It starts with him. In Genesis 23, we're told that Abraham had to go and buy a burying place for Sarah, his wife, because he didn't have any land of his own. So he had to go and do a deal with the Hittites at Hebron. And he says to the sons of Heth in Genesis 23 and verse 4, I am a stranger and a visitor among you. It's the same idea. He was a foreigner. Uh, he didn't enjoy the rights of a resident, someone who was from that place, uh, but he was someone just happen, happening to be staying there. And the word visitor is the word for tenant, someone who lives in a property that actually belongs to someone else. Abraham is saying, I haven't got any roots here. In fact, I haven't got anything here. That's what he's saying when he says he's a stranger and a pilgrim. And then you might remember Jacob and how in his latter years he went down to Egypt and met Pharaoh. And in Genesis chapter 47, we read of uh, Pharaoh meeting with Jacob and saying to Jacob, How old of you are you? And Jacob says, The days of the years of my pilgrimage. That's how he put it. The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. That's how they thought of themselves as people who were only temporary residents. People who didn't really uh, belong, didn't have a place, whose home lay elsewhere. And they were ones who didn't see the promises of God that God had made to them, as we're told there in verse 13. They didn't see those promises fulfilled in their lifetime. They didn't see them coming to pass. And you might think, well, you're light years away from that because you're living this side of the cross, but you're not light years away from it. Even though we stand this side of the cross and the empty tomb, uh, there's a sense in which we are standing in exactly the same shoes as Abraham, in that we still are looking forward to the fulfillment of the promises. What are the promises? Well, to cut to the heart of it, what Jesus says in John 12 and verse 46, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant shall be also. That's not all of it, but that's the nub of it. Where I am, there my servant will be also. And we don't see that fulfilled yet, do we? Or there's John 17, 24, where the Lord Jesus is praying to his Father the night of his betrayal. Father, I will that they whom you have given to me be with me where I am, that they should behold my glory. Uh, that's what I want for them. I want them to be with me where I am. And that's not yet the case for us, is it? And what this is teaching us is that it's important how you think about yourself. Do you really think about yourself as a stranger and a pilgrim in the world? And, and this really is important. You can see how important it is by the word that he uses here in the passage in verse 13, where he says, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. It's a very important word. It's a solemn and a solid word. And there's something really important about it. They confessed it. They took up a very distinct and deliberate position. You could think of it in these terms. Imagine a, a preacher who perhaps doesn't have a very high view, 
of the role that he fulfills in the life of the church. And he's asked what he does, and somewhat sheepishly he says to someone, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a preacher, that's, uh, that's all I do, really. It's as though he thinks it's not really a very important job. And if only he was a bit brighter, he might have a better job. After all, it's not quite what the world thinks of as being a successful career. But that is woeful ignorance of the place and the importance of preaching. And if, if he is truly understanding his call at all as a preacher, and the importance of preaching in the purposes of God for the gathering of the church and the perfecting of the saints, he'd stand, st stand tall and he'd say, I'm a preacher. Thank God that I'm a preacher. There's no work more strategic or useful in the purposes of God. That's the difference between admitting something and confessing something. A preacher shouldn't just admit that he preaches. He should confess it. It's important. And the same can be said, of course, about many other forms of, uh, of work in other contexts. Well, that's what's happening here. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. Is that how you consciously think about yourself as a Christian? There's a sense in which every Christian has to say, I do not belong. It's not that you escape the world by being a stranger or a sojourner, but you relate to the world in a particular way because you're a stranger and a pilgrim. If you know you're a stranger and a sojourner in the world, you're not going to get suckered in by false ideas about this world and reality. You don't get hoodwinked by all the claims uh, th that the world makes when it promises to us things that it can never fulfill. The world is constantly setting before people various idols to worship and serve, but they are to have no appeal to strangers and pilgrims. When the world promises easy access to money that you've never earned, well, a stranger and a pilgrim doesn't fall for that. When it says you can trust the government to look after you until the day you die. That's just one of thousands of idols that get set up for us to bow before. And we don't fall for it. Idols are not for strangers and pilgrims in the earth. So how do you think about yourself? Do you see yourself as a stranger and a pilgrim in the world? Or is there barely anything that is distinguishing you from the worldlings who are resident here. Are you serving their counterfeit gods? Or are you serving the living God? The emphasis you see is not so much on what I have as upon what I am. What I am. And if I know that, I'll be enabled to keep my bearings in the life of of faith. I am a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. And then not only must I know about my true identity, but I also, I also need to know my only home. Verses 14 and 15. In verse 14 and 15, he makes a correction. He says, when folks speak in this way, confessing themselves strangers and pilgrims and so on, they show that since they don't re belong where they are, they're looking for a homeland. And then he puts in a corrective and he says, when I say a homeland, don't think that I mean where they came from. They weren't thinking at all about the place of their origin. They never thought about going back to Mesopotamia, where they came from. That's how people ordinarily think of their homeland, the place of their origin. But he says, they weren't thinking in that way at all. Abraham was thinking about a homeland that lay in the future. Verse 15. Truly, if they'd called to mind the country from where they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. So that was their objective. They had a homeland that lay before them. And notice the present tense there. But now they desire or now they are desiring a God-promised homeland. And notice that this is what is implied then in God's promise to 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he promised the land to them. Their future homeland was already implied in that. You remember how in Genesis uh, 17, the Lord says to Abraham, I shall give to you and your seed after you the land of your pilgrimage, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. That was the promise he made. Now that promise of the land uh, to the patriarchs is often thought to be a promise fulfilled only in earthly terms. But really what matters is the heavenly inheritance. Can't insist exclusively on that, but if you go to Psalm 37 and verse 29, you read, the righteous shall possess the land and dwell in it forever. That was Old Testament faith. That is what they believed. Now, the land was promised to Abram's descendants, and those who are righteous shall possess the land and dwell in it forever, Scripture says. So when they had received the promise It wasn't simply that they would possess it and dwell there so long as they lived. And then that was it. But that the land would be their possession forever. They understood that there was an eternal element to this promise of God. God's promise of a place to his people. And, And I think the Old Testament saints understood far more about this than we sometimes Uh, suppose and suspect there's this eternal element of the promise and I'm I'm sure they grasp that now when he says in verse 16 now they desire a better that is a heavenly country he's not talking there about something ethereal up in the stratosphere heaven there heavenly in the text is referring to the source to the origin of the homeland where it comes from it's referring to what we Uh, read in uh, Revelation 21 and verse 1, where we read of the holy city, heavenly Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, from heaven, from God, to the earth. And Peter tells us there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So our ultimate hope is not all that different from the hope of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a new heaven and a new earth, a land in which the righteous will dwell forever. We look forward to that, as they looked forward to it. You would realise then that you have a, a, a homeland, a new earth, in which we will live in resurrected, glorified bodies. And that hope should protect you from all kinds of disappointments in this present life. It helps you keep a present perspective You don't have to be overly disappointed over some sense of lack of fulfillment in this present life if your vision is fixed on your only real homeland where we come to the consummation. Do you remember it was about uh, five years ago? uh, Thousands of people were stranded all over Europe because of uh, the closure of airports and the grounding of airplanes because of uh, a volcano that went off in um, that erupted in uh, Iceland and uh, the dust could affect the engines of aircraft and so everything was grounded for for days on end and people were left stranded in various places and had to make their way home uh, by any mode of transport other than a plane and uh, I don't know if you remember the days rolled on and you had these reporters in various places speaking to people who'd been stranded in that way And there was a reporter on a ferry coming back from France and he was interviewing uh, people as they were coming uh, towards the port and approaching Dover. One of the reporters said to a man, how do you feel seeing the white cliffs of Dover? You must be relieved to be home. Well, no, he said. It's the seven bridge that does that for me. I'm Welsh, you see. (laughs) In a similar way, there's nothing in this present world that can ultimately satisfy the child of God who walks by faith. Here, he is not home yet. He looks for a better that is a heavenly home. There were two elderly missionaries early last century who had spent much of their lives in Africa and they were going back to America. I think their names were Morrison. And uh, 
they were on passage on a steamer heading back to America. And on the same ship was President Theodore Roosevelt. He had been to Africa on one of his famous uh, safaris and shooting expeditions. He had a large entourage with him. And they were coming back on the same ship and their health was broken and they were facing an uncertain future. They had no pension. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. And uh, they came into New York. And as they came in, there were crowds of people to welcome Theodore Roosevelt. And there was a big band. And they watched all this hullabaloo as, as he left the ship. And then they left the ship. And there was no one there to greet them as they returned. And uh, they made their way to the place, the apartment, where they were going to stay that night. And he spoke of his distress. God's not being fair to us, he said. The Lord's not treating us in the right way. Why should he get that welcome? There wasn't a soul to meet us when we came back after a lifetime of service. And uh, his wife said, you need to speak to the Lord about that. He went into his room. He came out just a few minutes later. And his whole demeanor had changed. Well, what's happened, she said. He said, the Lord told me, I'm not home yet. I'm not home yet. We are looking for a better. That is a heavenly country. And if you want to walk the life of faith, you've got to get those bearings straight. So we are to be aware of our true identity and we are to recognise our true home. And then thirdly, we are to recognise our high privilege. Verse 16 again. Therefore, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now there's a connection there, isn't there? Therefore, since they cling to his promises, since they go on believing what he has told them, since they have fastened on to this God by faith, therefore he is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God is not ashamed, and they are not going to be ashamed. They're going to find that God has prepared a city for them. But the text says that God is not ashamed of them. Not ashamed to be called their God. That is an astounding statement. I hope you're at least a bit surprised by it. God is not ashamed to be called our God. We can sometimes become a bit jaded so that things don't strike us as they ought. But this is astonishing. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now the reference there, preparing a city for them, is, is to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it says God is not ashamed of them to be called their God. But think about who those men were. It wasn't really for any moral, particular moral excellence in them. What about Abraham? Well, he had his ongoing struggles with doubt. And Isaac was so strong-willed about wanting to manipulate God's plan and going his own way. You remember in Genesis 27. And Jacob, what, what a scheming, sneaky man he could be. But each held on... <clears throat> to the promises of God and believed that what God had promised to them he would certainly give to them and so we read in Exodus 3 and verse 6 God saying to Moses I am the God of your fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob oh if, if the Lord was speaking to my descendants I hope he could say that I am the God of your father I hope the Lord could say that to my children and to my grandchildren. But isn't it amazing that God should be willing to go by this designation? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That God should be willing to know as the God of three nomads who live their lives in tents. That's astonishing. But there's more. We need to notice the tents. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And here in Hebrews 11 verse 16 we read that God is not ashamed 
to be called their God. In other words, these men still exist in a relationship to God. And remember how the Lord Jesus took up that same uh, statement from Exodus 3 in Matthew 22 that we read earlier. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 31, Jesus said to the Sadducees, But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He's debating with the, Pharise the Sadducees about the resurrection, and that's what he says. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Remember what you were told there by Moses. Notice the present tense, I am. Now in Exodus 3, there's no there's actually no verb, but it does refer to the present time. So Jesus is right to render it as he d does, I am the God of Abraham. Isn't that astonishing? That he doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham. I used to be the God of Isaac. But 500 years after Abraham had died, talking to Moses, the Lord says, I am the God of Abraham. And when you see the words, the God of Abraham, you are not to understand from that, I am the God that Abraham served, but rather, I am the God to whom Abraham belongs. To whom Abraham belongs now. To whom Isaac belongs now. To whom Jacob belongs now. A funeral took place 500 years ago, Moses. But I am Abraham's God and I hold him now. If God is your God then he stands in an eternal living relationship to you. And he never lets you go. He never lets you go. God couldn't uh, speak, you see, like this if Abraham didn't exist any longer, could he? Uh, you can't have a king without having subjects. God cannot be the God of non-entities. He is the God of Abraham because Abraham is still and is in relationship with God. Abraham died centuries before, but he still exists. God still holds on to him. He will be resurrected. God pledges, you see, to be your God. And when God pledges to be your God, he never turns away from that. That's his commitment. I am your God. You belong to me. You are my people. What difference does that make? Well, I could illustrate it from the life of Ebenezer Erskine, one of the seceders in Scotland. As he was approaching the latter days of his life, his daughter uh, once spoke to him about a sermon he preached. She was reading a book. He asked her what it was. Your sermons, she said. Uh, what sermon is it? She said, Exodus chapter 3. I am the Lord your God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The best sermon, he said, I have ever preached. And uh, as he was approaching his death, a former church member uh, visited him at home and asked him how he was spending his days. He said, I do what I did 40 years ago. I am resting upon this word. I am the Lord your God. My God is a covenant God, he said. I can never be separated from him. And upon that word, I intend to die. And if this God then is your God, you can go through this life with all of its distresses and afflictions and joys and know that this God will not let you go. That is your high privilege. And yet we're also told this, and I find it very difficult to understand it. God is not ashamed to be called my God. There was in Mauritius, uh, at one time a slave woman 
The slaves on Mauritius were not allowed to wear shoes, but they could have some small paid employment. This woman used to do that and uh, saved her pennies and eventually used the money she had saved to buy the freedom of her daughter and then to buy her daughter a pair of shoes. And one day she saw her daughter sitting in the house and she went in and sat down next to her daughter and her daughter turned to her and said, How dare you sit next to me? I am a free woman. You are a slave. See, she was ashamed of her past. She was ashamed to be associated with what she once was and ashamed of the very one who had purchased her freedom. Well, God is not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed of us with all of our faults and our failings when we are struggling in our pathetic attempts very often at obedience to him and his commandments. Still, Scripture says, he is not ashamed of us. He is not ashamed to be called our God. If you want to get your bearings straight in the life of faith for the final run home, as it were, to your destination, you've got to fix your bearings here. You need to get a true sense of your identity, who you are as a stranger and a pilgrim in the earth. You have to realize that you're not home yet. There's a better and a heavenly country to which we are going, and you need to realize God is not ashamed to be called even your God. May he bless his word to us.